Welcome to the Love Fly podcast. It's Paul Tizard here, fear of flying coach. And today's guest is Aaron Ramot, who's an experimental test pilot, which I've never met before. So I'm really keen to hear your story. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us, tell us all about it. What do you do? Why doesn't it scare the life out of you? Right now, I don't do anything. I'm retired. Oh, I'm okay. 76 year old, years old. Yeah. I was born in uh, 46, 1946, two years before uh, my country was born. Ever since I was able to hold a fork and knife, I wanted to be a pilot. Mm. So I grew up and uh, I had some problems with the physical exams, trying to enlist into flight training school in the, of the Israeli Air Force. Yes, I was I was unable to uh, to get into the school for a while. I made some uh, tricks and then I I'm I'm uh, six foot five tall, which was a limitation for me to and to ah, see. be a pilot mm. small cockpits and stuff mm. uh, but then uh, i was able to measure myself correctly <laughs> so i was <laughs> i enlisted and i became a fighter pilot in 60 the end of 67 they think that you're six foot two did you go in and sort of yeah. squash, squash yeah. down did you maximum six foot two yeah <laughs> so Excellent. uh I, I was able to uh, be a, a fighter pilot for uh, almost 20 years. Mm. At the same time, when when I had uh, enough experience and I enjoyed what I I enjoyed what I do all the time, mm. but was, when I was experienced enough to to find a very uh, deep interest in in the mechanism, in the physics, and the entire uh, world of uh, Flying, right? I w- I wanted to become a test pilot because this really was my interest. So, also a few troubles, but then I I went to a flight training school for test pilots in the American U.S. Navy mm. in Patuxent River, Maryland, and uh, I joined the, the test forces, the test center, Israeli Air Force. Flight Test Center uh, in uh, 1979. And ever since, I continue to be uh, a, a fighter pilot with the Air Force in several uh, wars that I experienced. Uh, mm. But I've, I've made my professional life in flying uh, while test flying until uh, 2000. Okay. And then I joined. Then I joined. I I quit this uh, job of uh, test flying. Became a pilot for El Al Airlines until I retired. And now I ride my bicycle, testing my bicycle every day. That's probably and more dangerous. No, I doubt it. So sometimes it does. Yes. Sometimes it does. So I don't know what to start yeah. with because you've there's a lot of really interesting things there. So the fact you've you've been in the Israeli Air Force, mm-hmm. you've then moved into becoming a test pilot, which sounds terrifying. It's the same. I was still a test pilot for the Israeli Air Force. Mm. So, what, so I commanded. I eventually, before I retired from the Israeli Air Force, I commanded the flight test center of the Israeli Air Force, and then I joined the industry, the Israeli aircraft industries. Right. Then, as a civilian. Mm. That's really interesting. So, tell tell us about the the test pilot stuff. So what, what what exactly do you do? I mean, how much do you test these aircraft and how much at risk are you when you do that? That's a big question. A test pilot is actually the end, the end unit of or the end unit of building an airplane from scratch. Mm. You begin at the uh, scratch board and you and you go out and cut the metals and uh, install systems that eventually the test pilot job is to uh, integrate all these systems 
into a flying object. It is very important in uh, fighter airplanes. Yes. Which uh, their uh, flight envelope is very, very demanding in yes. terms of speeds and uh, maneuvering stuff. But it's also very important, very useful <laughs> for uh, airlines and passengers, airplanes. Different disciplines, but uh, the same. principally it's the same uh, job. The, part of the, the test pilot needs to uh, take off and yeah. integrate all the systems into one operating safe system. I also, um, it is very common in the, in, in the Air Force that you already, you know, the Israeli Air Force, for instance, gets its uh, airplane aircraft from different countries. Mm. And then we install systems into these aircraft, our system, our yes. weapons and stuff. So we need to, to integrate those systems to the airplanes. The, the airplanes, the aircraft never uh, saw the system uh, before, never uh, carried, for instance, uh, smart bombs or uh, sophisticated uh, avionics and uh, mm. uh, interesting navigation pods. And uh, the test pilot said to, uh, to find out, first of all, if the, the system is flight worthy. If it can fly, it doesn't disturb another aircraft system. And then that it, its operation is uh, safe to operate and that it function and that uh, that uh, it is doing its job. Navigation spot, mm. you need to see the, the, the terrain, you need to, to avoid the obstacles and stuff. This is a very uh, common in the combat airplanes. Business. Yes. When, uh, you, when you fly test business jet or a, or a big passenger airplane, the main issue is the airplane does not need very wide uh, maneuvering envelope no it rather rather it needs to be to make sure that it is safe to fly yes and that all the systems operate and there is a, a redundancy in the in the systems of the aircraft and this is tested how do we test redundancy we just fail one system and see that everything is working fine and then we fail the other system and the, we see. We want to make sure that we can land the aircraft. So, so you just so, maybe, look, so just to put that's a really important point. So when you're testing these aircraft, yeah, you're literally deliberately doing <laughs> what we all worry about, stopping yeah. everything working to see if it still works. In, in the world of uh, of business flying and uh, passenger fly, airplane, I know, like you, uh, one of your uh, job is to to extinguish the fear of flying. Yes, That's what we do in, uh, in here in Israel with Alon, we we need to make sure that passengers are safe. Yes, in that in that uh, manner we make uh, sure that the airplanes, the systems, and uh, everything is really redundant. So, for instance, we there is a uh, the uh, FAA and other uh, authorities in different mm. countries. They have demands for us to make sure that the airplane, if one engine fails, still the airplane is fully operating, operable. Yes. And uh, I I was once involved in a test of an aircraft. We have to prove that the failure is still does not affect uh, the safety of the airplane. So it's very common that uh, we take off with an engine failed during the takeoff. We need to make sure that uh, we um, that we are able to take off as advertised by the mm. manufacturer. We need to make sure that the instrument landing system, which is very very uh, needs very accurate approach yes. profile, yes. is uh, never fails. Mm. It never statistically never fails. We need to make sure that, for instance, we test it during 20 consecutive uh, approaches and it it should be within you know a feet or two from uh, from the approach 
profile. If it does not, in even up, you know, you made nineteen approaches, nice, and one is failed. Everything is failed from the beginning. Statistic. Wow! So let's just let's just pause on yeah. that. That's a fantastic point. So you yeah. do nineteen accurate landings yeah. or approaches. Yeah, and then on the twentieth, if it's not within it, your what you can deem to be, not within the, the window of uh, yeah, we have to go again and replan uh, the the system. That's very I reassuring. To, <laughs> I was involved once in uh, for for the uh, uh, business jet uh, that we built in uh, in the Israel aircraft industry. Mm. It's now called uh, uh, Gulfstream. Uh, 2200 I think it, yeah. we called it galaxy anyway we uh, we had to prove that after landing with maximum landing weight that is very heavy and we after this landing we need to uh, break at the shortest uh, breaking distance and after that we had to evacuate the passengers to simulate evacuation of the passenger. Yeah. Yeah, and then due to the big heat of the brakes, the tires got fire, and uh, we stood out there looking at the fire coming <laughs> up and uh, extinguished. By no no means of fire extinguishing, we need to make sure we 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 proved that uh, even we, if we do this very very extreme kind of maneuver of landing in maximum maximum landing weight. And maximum breaking at that time, and fire comes up, no damage to uh, to the aircraft systems except for the tires. That's brilliant. So this is true for the uh, this is the corner of of business jet and uh, passengers airplane, where in the uh, combat combat jets, it's a whole different uh, story. We need to prove and make sure. That the airplane also. Well, first of all, the airplane is the airplane is uh, performing its job with the pilot minimum effort as required. And also, we need to make sure that uh, with failures of the system and uh, maneuver maneuvering that uh, goes beyond the flat envelope, there is a possibility of the pilot to get back to this uh, to inside the flat envelope. For instance, uh, we tested the, our, an aircraft that we built in Israel, the Kfir, a fighter airplane. We tested in spin. Spin is a, is a maneuver that you don't want to go into it, but you need to be able to come out of it once yeah, you yeah. entered, you made an error and, and came into it. So we we spun the, the Kfir several times. One, it is a, it is a test pilot, a test uh, airplane. Aaron, so, do you enjoy yeah. doing this? Because this sounds like this sounds like crazy. It's stuff. a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed my job very much. I was very much involved in going into deep into technique of flight of the testing, the technique of what what to expect while test flying, and uh, how to be able to save myself if things went wrong too wrong. To the point that uh, the aircraft uh, is not doing what is expected. For instance, in this uh, spin testing, we had a special parachute to be able to save the airplane if the spin does not uh, recover, if the, pilot, if the aircraft does not recover by the means of uh, normal controls that we we provide the airplane with the, for the pilot. So the the Routine was, we enter the spin, and then after three or, th or four spins for a uh, roaring <laughs> roller coaster, we um, Im implied the controls to recover. Usually, it did recover after another two or three ro uh, rolls of spin, at, at enough in a uh, safe enough altitude. The procedure was it, if does if it does not recover at twenty thousand feet, we shoot the parachute to recover, and then we go and see what to do after we land. So one of the spins, I, I did several spins. It it came out, it recovered very nicely, 
one of them with a certain configuration, the aircraft did not recover and did not recover and did not recover. And I had my finger already on the, on the button to uh, release the, the safe, safety shoot. And only then the airplane last minute did recover. So first, the aircraft was enough, good enough to recover itself. Yes. And uh, second, I was about to uh, <laughs> execute recovery, non-normal recovery procedure. Are you like, because this to me like sounds, I mean, for some people that's probably fun, but that, that sounds terrifying. You must be, you must be very confident mm -hmm. that the aircraft, that you can do all these maneuvers and fail things. Uh, I am confident in understanding what to expect. Sometimes the unexpected comes uh, comes on, and that's what, what I, I'm there for. I mean, I was in before I became a, or in order to be a test pilot, I uh, I experienced uh, or I I had more than five thousand uh, flight hours in the fighter airplane. That's and, a lot. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah. Because fighter airplanes fly short uh, missions. Mm, and, exactly. Yeah. And uh, then I also added some, uh, another uh, 5,000 before I was, uh, uh, oh, 5,000 flight hours in a uh, cargo airplanes, passengers airplanes. So I was very much, uh, I felt very comfortable while airborne. I was experienced enough to expect every every phenomena that I yes. could expect. Still, I had some other phenomena that I didn't expect. But I was, I was sometimes I was afraid. You, I mean, I was yeah, I was afraid, but I was afraid from the unknown uh, yes. that, that can come on me. So, but, is this in the military but, jets where this happened? But what I was about to say that I was afraid sometimes even more during the wars I, I participated in. Yes, uh, and I had some very interesting uh, missions, not not as a test pilot, but as a fighter pilot mm. during the wars. I was afraid. This is normal, and uh, I was able to to op uh, to operate and to function while being afraid. This is yeah. I learned this also as a part of later becoming a test pilot. I mean, even if you're afraid, you still have to function and, mm. uh, and count on your skills. Mm. And most of all, before you go flight testing, you learn very much, uh, very deeply, the system, the uh, the physics of the, the system, or even if it's a, you know, like hydraulic system. You test the hydraulic system, you know it by, you know, the pipes and the, and the uh, pumps. And it is true also for a complete system as a, of an airplane, that you know what, ev what every screw is meant for, every button. And you understand the physics of flying. You understand aerodynamics. Yes. And uh, I mean, understand deep into it. And you understand what to expect when, mm. and uh, that's what make you makes you uh, better or not better. Well, I mean, of. so you doing that makes yeah. it safer because you've gone out and tested things that other pilots won't need to do. Yeah, hopefully you 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 push the airplane into corners that the pilots are not expected to do, and. Uh, but, and you push the airplane, you go into outside the flight envelope, you exceed the speeds. This is as a test. You exceed the speeds, you exceed the, you exceed the altitude. And then you, you create the, the flight envelope for the normal, regular pilots. For instance, I was able, I was once required to take off with the kefir at maximum takeoff. At, uh, at, uh, different uh, elevation of the airfield. And uh, the airplane was was loaded with bombs and, uh, and fuel tanks and stuff. It was very, very heavy. And I took off. And I, it was a very, very low terrain avoidance while taking off. 
And it made me as a pilot decide that this weight is not, not uh, within the limits of a normal pilot. So we had to make a half to uh, reload the airplane with uh, one, uh, one or a half a ton less for, uh, for it to be uh, among the uh, regular operate, operable. Yeah. Uh, so I guess there's only so much you can do with computers and simulations. Essentially, it does boil down to somebody, some crazy person like you, <laughs> thank you, to go and try these things out, doesn't it? To go and push yeah, the no. aircraft to well beyond what it'll ever need to do. The point is that, you know, today the computers and the wind tunnels and stuff can almost prove everything the airplanes should do. Just computing and uh, calculating and uh, showing the, the effects in a wind tunnel. Still, no wind tunnel and no computer was airborne yet. You need to be airborne and, and be able to test them, test the systems while flying, actually, with all the bumps and the weather criteria and weather phenomena. Mm. Everything is being tested only in the air, not in wind tunnel. Yeah, I was going to ask you actually about, you know, <clears> perhaps <throat> testing some of the business passenger jets, or whatever, in weather systems, what sort of things you've had to fly into? Weather is a is a big issue, Based, mainly for uh, passenger airplanes and uh, business jets, because they are operated in, in very, very demanding weather, for instance, high uh, snow or big clouds, like storms and stuff. And they need to be able to avoid them. And once they did, they did not, or they were not able to avoid, they need to be able to carry on yes. and, uh, and stay. For instance, we have a phenomenon that's called icing. Icing is that is the... Um, the ice that covers the wing and changes its uh, uh, aerodynamic uh, capability. And also it is heavy. So uh, it, it, it creates a, a higher loads on the wing and the aircraft. On, on the aircraft. So we need to, 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 and also snow and ice can penetrate into the engine. The engine is sucking air with or without snow, with or without ice, with rain, it needs to be able to operate. So we test the engine while flying into very high snowing conditions. You're crazy. We are. So we we do it with the, uh, with the engine, uh, one engine of the airplane. We have two engines in this airplane. And we had, uh, it is, again, the Galaxy. And uh, it's a small galaxy, not a big one. Mm. So we had one engine very installed very, very heavily against snow conditions, snow and ice condition. And we took the other engine while flying into snow and ice conditions, let it accumulate its uh, snow on the inlet, on the, uh, in the engine itself. And then we had to operate the anti-icing system. Same to see that the airplane, that the engine is still operable. Same is true for uh, icing on the wing. The wing can be iced to the point that, uh, you know, it doubles the, the weight of yes. the airplane. So we need to be able to avoid this icing. Uh, so we fly into icing condition. We see that the wing is being iced and then we uh, turn off, turn on the uh, switch to to de-ice the wing. Uh, this is weather. Other weather phenomena like rain and uh, wet runway. We need to be able to show that the airplane is is landable on wet runway without skidding off it. Man, you so just I, my <laughs> massive respect to you. So you're doing all the things that pilots don't need to do basically so you can prove that how safe it we, is all we do is prove that what we plan for the airplane to do it, it it is doing it 
Mm. And when we prove it, we prove it a little bit beyond what is expected. Yes. And then we we uh, we say this is the limit of the airplane. If the run is that is that wet, you don't land. Or for instance, a wind effect. Wind affect the airplane very much, especially on landing and takeoff. Yes. And uh, you're talking about you have, cross cross you have a crosswind. Yeah. If you have a crosswind, ninety degrees to the runway, and this is the only runway that you have. You need to be able to control the airplane and not drift aside yes. due to the wind. And we test the airplane in a very high crosswind. And then we say the limit crosswind is 40 knots, 30 knots, or 50 knots, depend on the aircraft. Yeah. Light aircraft like, uh, you know, Cessnas and stuff, they are limited to uh, 15 knots yes. of, of crosswind. Mm. But the big airplanes, the Jumbo and the 777, they are limited to almost 45 degrees, 45 knots of uh, yeah. crosswind. This is very, and it is all tested. The flight conditions of uh, of a 90 degrees crosswind is tested. You, you don't want to to be in the cockpit of this airplane. That uh, no, I don't. Tested. No, you don't. <laughs> I'm glad you were there anyway. <laughs> so you, there's people like you doing this. Testing the aircraft, setting the limits, and making sure. I mean, this is massively reassuring for people. So, what other scary things do you do then? Because this, I think, for people who listen to this who are nervous flyers, it's nice for them to think about all the other things that could go wrong, and that some some poor sod like you has been testing it. <laughs> if you're interested in scaring, yes, there is. I was. Uh, it's not testing flying. Uh, test flying. I was flying a hang glider. Which is uh, oh, the the, yeah. the, <laughs> the most I shall say thrilling flight I had in my life was during the flight test training yeah. in the United States. Some of the training was uh, glider training. It, glider is a is a flight aircraft, is a flying aircraft with no engine, so it glides all the time. What it needs. For uh, for uh, going up is to soar on thermals, like the birds do when they migrate. So and it is uh, thermal is a is a warm air that that climbs up inside whatever air there is. So I had a flight in, a, in an area at the Tucson River in Maryland that. The, the briefing of the flight was you are being towed with a bladder to 3,000 feet and you are released and then you have some maneuvers to do like uh, stalling and spinning and stuff at uh, 1,000 feet AGL above ground level you need to concentrate in landing at the airfield. So you have about uh, half an hour of flight on the glider and uh, that's what is expected of you so now I'm flying. I'm doing my uh, my testing, my my maneuvers. Me and the uh, and guy from the Marine Corps, and at about uh, one one thousand uh, one hundred elevation, I see a bird. Bird is standing in for me. It is you know standing in the sky, not flat, not flapping, you know, nothing. Just wings uh, spread, and I feel. And I see also on the instruments that there's a, a, a small bump in the air. So I told my uh, my guy in the back seat, if the bird can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I had no no idea of how to uh, sen- uh, center a thermal. We call it that you you catch the thermal and, and climb mm. soar with this. So I lo- I turned I, I turned into the bird. Again, when I passed near the bird, I had this bump, and the bird moved aside. Moved aside. Once again, I turned and, uh, and uh, aimed at the bird. The bird just got rid of me. It uh, folded its wing and went off. But I felt this uh, bump. And remember, no no indication where it is except for my instruments and the bump mm. that I feel. And after two and a half hours, I was I was at five thousand five hundred feet. Oh wow! 
And that's why they call me the crazy Israeli pilot <laughs> in the school, <laughs> in the flight training school. So you, I assume you, so did, I, you, so you did I, land at some point then, I guess. They shouted. Eventually. They, they, so, they shot said, what down. are you doing here? You are expected <laughs> to land after 30 minutes. And yet you are two and a half hours. Uh, where are you? I said, look up and you see me <laughs> on the radio. <laughs> and they, uh, I, I went back for the landing, no problem. But that's why I said I went into uh, hang gliding because, again, it's a mm. hang glider. There is no engine. You glide, and if there are thermals, you soar with the birds. It's a fantastic way of flying. Very, very quiet, very slow, mm. not a too Mach jet, <laughs> and uh, very thrilling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's quite a good link, actually, because one of the things that our pilots talk about is the fact that how often commercial aircraft are almost like gliders. Certainly when you're coming into land and you're, say, 80 miles away from, the, you, you know, you're pretty much gliding. So I guess yeah. you must have to test that as well, turn all the engines to idle or off and see and glide for a while. Is that part of the when, training? When we say gliding uh, on, on commercial aircraft, it's not like the glider that uh, mm. glides. Totally different because the rate of descent is the better. Glide for the commercial aircraft is part of the procedure that was developed by test pilots and uh, and computers and then test pilots yeah. to uh, to indicate and the computer in the, the the avionics of the aircraft and the entire uh, computing system indicates where to start this glide in uh, in order to be able at zero zero uh, altitude at the uh, destination airfield so it is gliding <clears throat> yet it has its engine engine provides very poor very little uh, thrust while gliding but the aircraft can can glide really glide with the engines in operation we have we are uh, we are trained to glide with no engines in the airplane. It is very 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 actually. There is one only one and one aircraft that I know, maybe two, that that uh, operated while gliding after it ran out of fuel. Engines uh, jet yeah. engines with no fuel don't operate. Hmm. So, uh, but the, the airplane was able to to glide into the airfield in the Canary Island. And you test all that? Uh, it is being tested, yes. So how far would you say you would expect a commercial aircraft to be able to glide if it had no power coming from the engines? What would you say was uh We have typical? numbers. The numbers uh, say that the airplane will, uh, will lose about three miles for each mile of altitude, one to three or something like that. Mm. Uh, but it is it is a number never proven except for a test flight, not not to the not to the bitter end, but at least with no engines to be able to to see how how gliding is performed in the commercial aircraft. But I don't see why it is I see why it is needed to be proven. The aircraft, the commercial aircraft are so safe and uh, so redundant. Yes. That, uh, once we had the most aircraft were a four engine uh, aircraft. Mm. Now most of the uh, aircraft, the commercial aircraft are uh, two engine. Enough. Yeah. Which means, back to the testing issue, which means that if you lose an engine for, during takeoff, for instance, it can happen. We had this uh, guy Soli who landed in the in the Hudson because he lost both engines. Yeah, with birds. It's very rare, but so and he glided into the Hudson. Mm. So if you lose an engine with the with a four engine aircraft, you lose one quarter of the of the power takeoff power. If you lose one engine in a 777 or uh, the Airbus 350 with two engines, if you lose one engine, can happen. 
you are losing 50% of your uh, mm. thrust, yet you can take off. That when you lose an engine at a certain speed, that mm. you don't have enough runway to to uh, stop the engine, the, yes. the, the takeoff roll, you have enough power, enough thrust to uh, lift off and avoid any uh, obstacle after running, behind the runway. I think some of the things you've said will be really, really helpful for people who are nervous. So as a kind of a, a there's probably loads of questions I should be asking, but I'm trying to put my nervous flyer head on <laughs> and think about it. But the main message I'm getting is about how much extra safety and redundancy there is because of people like you testing the aircraft, pushing them beyond what we'd expect them to do normally. And that's very reassuring for people. Uh, yeah. I was going to I was going to ask you then if you were talking to a nervous flyer now and you could say why they shouldn't be scared of flying what would you say based on your many years of experience as being a test pilot and and a commercial pilot and also a fighter pilot the issue is really narrowed to the uh, commercial aircraft world these aircraft are being uh, manufactured in in big numbers, and also uh, we several things were developed. First of all, systems are very very trustworthy. You, you know, even the cars. I, I remember <laughs> in early days, while while traveling from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Every one or two miles, one or two kilometers, there was a car standing on the <laughs> side road yes. uh, with the smoke or the... These things don't happen anymore. Mm. Everything is very, very... Engineered? Is that the word you Engineered want? to the point that they don't break. They yeah. don't fail. Mm. This is one thing. Mm. Other thing is that we have, like I mentioned in previous... Uh, I mentioned redundancy. We have... Uh, several systems in the aircraft, and for instance, hydraulic system, we had four of these systems. If one fails, you don't even feel it. Airplane, airplane are built in the philosophy of fail, operate, fail, safe, and uh, fail, operate, fail, operate, and then fail, safe. In 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 a matter of uh, systems failure, so. There is a big redundancy. Main issue of building airplanes is redundancy and uh, uh, extra systems. Mm. Airplane can operate on one system, but we have four. Yeah, uh, hydraulic system, electronic electrical system, uh, pressurization system. Two engines is also uh, one of the, uh, like I mentioned, redundancy. And then after all this, we develop a pr procedure that. Need that covers every every supposed failure, and every supposed activation of failures of, uh, of the system of the airplane. So we, as a crew, crew of two, in fact, aircraft, aircraft there's mostly in all, most places one pilot. In the commercial aircraft, you have two, and we are checking each other all the time while yes. while flying. And the procedures, the SOP, the uh, standard operation procedures, standard. Mm -hmm. We are very much into standardization of uh, procedures, and we uh, we call the the check and we check it with the other pilot. So, airplanes, commercial airplanes, are operated by very very trustworthy systems and very very experienced procedures based on experience. And uh, this really covers, and they don't, aircraft, the, the aircraft really flies mainly all time, all the time in the center of the envelope. We don't go to slow, very slow speed, very demanding maneuvers. We don't do it. We fly in the center of the envelope most of the time. And we ever, whenever we, uh, we go out of this uh, center, we go back into the center to uh, make sure that everything is calm and uh, you know standard. And that's what I would uh, tell the 
also, you know, with while flying those machines, there are noises and bumps in the it's like flying like driving a car. The car with the bumpy road is uh, is jumping all the time. That's all. The airplane, the aircraft itself is built to not even uh, you know consider it as a as a problem. Amazing. Thank you very much, Aaron. That's amazing. And well, I will say I, I feel like I thought I want to say thank you for your service because it's people like you that are keeping it safe for the rest of us and allowing pilots to understand what the envelope is because you've gone outside of it to test these damn things. So that's yeah. just remarkable. <laughs> I can I can say that it is very interesting. Yeah. And uh, you know that the people that will implement all the procedures that you develop and all the flight characteristics and flight maneuvers that you told them you you, uh, you are responsible of developing research and develop r and d is, uh, is my job mm. well thank you welcome <laughs> you probably helped thank a you. lot of people that that those little bits of wisdom there and uh, come fly and, with me yeah, and well, just take it easy on that. Not bicycle. testing, flat, not testing. No yeah. testing. No, I don't fancy that. Thanks very much. But uh, yeah, just be careful on that bicycle because that sounds like you're in real danger compared to the stuff. I just, I'm we just blowing away. We didn't go there. into this. <laughs> Aram, thank you very much, sir. That thank was you. Excellent. Very good. Very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Love Fly podcast. And if you want to find out about more that we do, please go to our website, lovefly.co.uk, and you'll see a list of other options available to you should you need them. Thanks for listening.